prayer, O Lord, even as we have sung this prayer together for the fruit of your word, the power of the Spirit's ministry in our souls. Refresh us, O God, by that spiritual ministry wrought from heaven itself, by the Spirit of Christ himself in our hearts. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. When Paul left Troas, he set out for Jerusalem. He set out to get back for the day of Pentecost in Jerusalem. He was in a hurry. He was in a rush. And so when he set sail together with the other men from Assos, he couldn't afford to stop in Ephesus because he anticipated that there would be a delay there. that they might even attempt to detain him as he was moving on, moving forward. So instead, he, as he was sailing, if you looked at the geography of the, the east coast of the Aegean Sea and you pinpoint Troas uh, in Asia there in eastern Asia, uh, rather western Asia minor, um, you, you can see on a map that Paul sailed past Ephesus to Miletus. But even though he was in a hurry, even though he was rushed, he took the time. His concern for the church at Ephesus was so great that he, he took the time to summon the elders From Ephesus, they would have had to come to him on foot, likely, to meet him there in Miletus, that he might this one last time instruct them concerning their responsibilities in the church. This was his final investment in the church at Ephesus a final deposit of the Word of God deposited in these elders so that they would, in turn, be more faithful in their ministry in the church that Paul had established, built up there in Ephesus. In the context of the book of Acts, Paul's address to the Ephesian elders is his last message delivered to a predominantly Gentile audience in a predominantly Gentile venue. These are Paul's closing words to the Gentiles. The Gentiles, remember, Paul's unique sphere of ministry, the apostle to the Gentiles, is speaking in this particular context, for a final time among these elders who he administered to for three years, telling them that he, they'd never see his face again, a, a reality that pierced their hearts with great pain. The text is pregnant. It's bursting with instruction for the church of Jesus Christ. And it's filled with emotion. It is, um, this is an emotionally charged text. As we, as we look at this text together this morning, we're going to hone in on two particular metaphors. Two metaphors may not be evident at, on the face of the text, but Paul is using two Old Testament metaphors to charge these elders. At the ordination installation service Friday night, there was a charge. Um, there are always charges at these 
kinds of events. Uh, there's a sermon, and then there, um, there is, there's a charge to the minister who's being ordained and installed as a minister in that particular church. There's a charge to the congregation sometimes uh, at, at a time when the church is being organized. There will be charges to the officers of the church, the elders, the deacons of the church. So Ethan Bolliard was charged uh, by uh, the minister under, under whom he served his internship in Taylor, South Carolina. That's what Paul is doing here. He's charging these elders. He's setting before them their responsibilities to the church of Jesus Christ. And the two metaphors that Paul uses are that of a watchman and of a shepherd. So we'll look at those two things in particular. The charge to be faithful watchmen in the church and the charge to be faithful shepherds in the church. But then Paul does something. Thirdly, because of the great responsibility and the difficulty involved in being a watchman and a shepherd, he commends them to God. He commends them to the divine protector. So there's a charge to be faithful watchmen. There's a charge to be faithful shepherds. There's an appeal to the divine protector. Paul, in the first place, charged these elders to be faithful watchmen. When he declared in verse 26, I am innocent of the blood of all men, he was alluding to a sobering metaphor that God had used when he charged Ezekiel with his duties as a prophet. God compared his spokesman to a watchman a, a watchman posted on the city wall to be a lookout for impending attacks on the city, Ezekiel 3 and Ezekiel 33. You find this charge in both of those, of those passages. If the watchman, if you remember these passages... If the watchman, seeing the danger lurking on the horizon, sounded the warning trumpet, citizens who failed to heed that trumpet, failed to heed the warning, had only themselves to blame if they were destroyed by the enemy. But if the watchman failed to sound the trumpet, then the destruction that came upon that city and its inhabitants was was on the watchman. It was, he was accountable. Their blood was on his head. And in both passages, both in Ezekiel 3 and 33, the focal point is the watchman's responsibility to bring God's message of warning to the people. In in Ezekiel chapter 3, verse 17, Son of man, I have appointed you as a watchman to the house of Israel. Whenever you hear a word from my mouth, warn them from me. So this is not the prophet bringing his own warning. It's the prophet bringing a message of warning, saying, thus says the Lord to the people, which we see again and again, don't we, in, in, uh, in the Old Testament scriptures, in, in the prophets. And then in chapter 33 and verse 7, we have the same kind of emphasis. Now as for you, son of man, I've appointed you as a watchman for the house of Israel so that you will so that you will hear a message from my mouth and give them a warning from me. So Paul is, is alluding here as the both of these texts go on to speak about 
the duties of a watchman and the responsibilities of a watchman, the blood that would come upon the watchman's head if he failed in his duty, Paul is alluding to that Old Testament metaphor. And his affirmation that he's innocent of the blood of all men in verse 26 of our text is his way of saying, I have been a faithful watchman. I've carried out this duty faithfully as God's watchman. As God has spoken to me the word of revelation, as the Spirit has worked in me, I've been faithful to declare it to you. You see what the the apostle's doing here. It's by example to these elders that he's saying to them, now you go and you do the same. You be faithful watchmen in the church. And he gives numerous reasons throughout our text. He gives us numerous reasons for for, for his confidence that he had indeed been a faithful watchman. In In the first place, Paul had brought a complete message. He preached the whole counsel of God, verse 27. That's a very familiar verse to us, isn't it? We often talk about that. We talk about the whole counsel of God, the whole message of the Scriptures. Paul had held nothing back that would have profited his hearers. He didn't pull any punches. He didn't soft pedal the word. He refused to trim the message of Scripture, to appeal to their tastes, or to avoid their prejudices. He didn't sift through God's revealed word and say, well, this part's not important. This really doesn't apply to us. This part does. But in the way he conducted himself, is that that manner by which he proclaimed to Timothy, all Scripture is inspired by God profitable for teaching, for reproof, for rebuke, that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So, Paul preached the whole counsel of God, and he preached the whole truth that God had revealed with Christ as the center of that revealed truth. Notice verse 21, repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 25, the kingdom of God, the message of Christ himself. Verse 32, the word of God's grace. So Paul brought a complete message. That's the first confidence he has, that he was a faithful watchman. Secondly, he addressed a comprehensive audience. Verse 21, he testified to both Jews and Greeks. He didn't gravitate toward Jews. It was his habit, it was his pattern to go to the synagogue when he he came to a city and preached the gospel to the Jews. But he didn't stop there. He didn't gravitate toward Jews with their historic covenantal connections, their knowledge of the word He didn't gravitate toward raw pagans either, or vice versa. He understood that everybody needed the grace offered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. So he brought a complete message to a comprehensive audience and was compelled by a compassionate motive. Notice in verses 18 and 19 first. It's quite striking, isn't it, that he spent all this time in Asia, which is a fairly good-sized province, but he spent the whole time that he was there in Ephesus. So the whole time I was in Ephesus, I was with you, serving the Lord with all humility and tears. And then in verse 31, he says, Remember how night and day, for a period of three years, 
I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. And he tells us that he maintained this compassion for the gospel. Even in the face of the trials, verse 19, that came upon him. So the plots that the Jews raised up against him didn't hold him back. None of the trials that he endured during this time of ministry held him back from compassionately preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. A complete message to a comprehensive audience with a compassionate motive with a commendable consistency. Any place, any time. That was Paul's motto. Wherever God gives me an open door, that's where I'll preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. He declares, verse 20, that he taught publicly and from house to house. He taught in public venues. He taught in the synagogues, often during these three missionary journeys. He had done so, remember, for three months in the city of Ephesus itself. He taught in the Areopagus in Athens. He taught in the lecture hall of Tyrannus in the city of Ephesus publicly, but then he also taught house to house. This is likely a, a reference to how uh, churches that met in homes, so house churches, but there, there were also evident uh, those times when Paul ministered to families, individual families, or even individuals. And Philippi is a prime example, isn't it, where he was welcomed into Lydia's home. He was also welcomed into the home of Aquila and Priscilla. And he spoke to the Philippian jailer and, and his household in the jailer's house. So Paul ministered publicly. He ministered privately. He preached the gospel commendably in all of these venues. So this first metaphor, I'm, I'm innocent of all the blood of men. Again, this is Paul's way of saying, I've, I've been faithful as a watchman among you. I've, I've faithfully discharged my duty to, live, to deliver God's message to you. And the, the review of this commendable ministry in Ephesus, constantly preaching the whole of God's truth with urgent compassion to all sorts of people in various venues is an indirect way of charging these Ephesian elders to do the same in their ministries. There would have been ministers among these elders. He's using elders as a comprehensive term to refer to those who were uh, teaching elders, as we call them, as well as ruling elders. So, a charge to be faithful watchmen. But that, then secondly, there's a charge to be faithful shepherds. When he began to address the elders' responsibilities directly, he turned to another Old Testament metaphor in verse 28. Be on guard for all the flock. Shepherd the church of God. We find that metaphor in the prophets as well, in Jeremiah, in Ezekiel, Jeremiah 23, Ezekiel 24. Israel's elders had, as we, as we summarize the, the, the passage in Jeremiah 23 and Ezekiel 34, they had, Israel's leaders had scattered the sheep rather than gathering them. They had exploited the sheep rather than feeding them them and protecting them. They didn't retrieve the stray sheep. They didn't bandage, they didn't bind the wounds of the shepherd. They didn't discipline the strong rams in the flock that bullied the weaker sheep in the flock. And so the Lord declares there 
that He Himself would come, that He would seek, that He would bind up, that He would discipline the flock. He would appoint over them a single shepherd, the righteous branch descended from David, Jesus, the good shepherd. Jeremiah 23 in verse 5 says. But Jeremiah 23 also predicts a plurality of faithful shepherds replacing Israel's unfaithful shepherds, where God says through the prophet, I will also raise up shepherds, plural, over them, and they will tend them, and they will not be afraid anymore, nor will any be missing. So God is going to correct these flaws in the leaders. He's going to correct this lack of shepherding of the flock. The fulfillment of this promise is the body of elders or overseers as our translations say here, bishops uh, in the church. All those three terms are synonymous, elder, bishop, overseer, are synonymous for elders in the church of Jesus Christ. Mentioned here by Paul, mentioned by Peter as well, elders to shepherd the flock of God, to feed, to protect, to discipline, God's people for further growth in grace. And it's through these shepherds then that Jesus now cares for the flock of Jesus Christ. They are under shepherds, as we like to call them, of the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And Paul mentions several factors here to motivate elders in their responsibility. In the first place, elders are appointed by the Holy Spirit. Verse 28. They don't hold office of their own right, but the Holy Spirit makes them overseers to shepherd the church of God. So the Spirit working through the discernment of the church appoints them, installs them, in the church of Jesus Christ. Second, God paid an infinite price to acquire this flock. Also, in verse 28, shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Now, God does, uh, Paul does not mean, of course, that God had, uh, has veins, capillaries, and blood. Uh, the, the, the blood is, of course, the blood of the divine Christ, the names, the attributes of the one are attributed to the other person of the Trinity. That's, what, that's the way our confession states this truth. And the price that God paid to purchase his sheep was the death of his only begotten son. And since God has paid such a great price, since he's made such an infinite investment in the church, since the church is so precious to the Son of God that he would go so far as to shed his blood for the church of Jesus Christ. Elders must be diligent to, walk, to keep watch over the flock. They must be careful. They must take great care to shepherd the flock of God. But then third, Paul says that God's flock would face great danger from without and from within, verses 29 and verse 30. After Paul's departure, savage wolves, false prophets, and teachers would attack the flock from outside the church, verse 29 says. The New Testament is replete with warnings like this from various Scripture writers. Even more alarming, was Paul's pronouncement that predators would arise from within the church. 
from your own selves, Paul says, and would draw disciples away from Christ to them, steal the flock away, lead them not to green pastures, but down false paths where there is no nourishment. There are no still waters. Paul's epistles to Timothy reveal that these weren't idle threats. Again and again, you remember, Paul warns Timothy about these false teachers. And as we read the pastoral epistles, we read about these these threats that the church at Ephesus had to deal with. Remember, Timothy was uh, Pastor Timothy of of the church at Ephesus. So real threats are, 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 are being pronounced here by the apostle. And in light of those threats, then, Paul is saying to these elders, because of the internal threat, because of the external threat, he He reinforces the earlier charge to keep watch by saying, be on the alert. That's why elders are such sticklers for doctrine. I remember when I I first was exposed to the Reformed faith in an OPC church in California, I thought, these guys, they're just so concerned about, are so wrapped up. They get wrapped up around the axle about doctrine. What's the big deal about doctrine? Well, as I, the, more I, the more I read and the more experience I gained as a member of the church and then an elder of the church, and I began to realize that it really is a big deal, isn't it? Doctrine is a big deal. It's important. So elders do what they do, they're especially the men of the church that are supposed to be watchful for doctrine, and watchful for those wolves, savage wolves that come from without, and some, yes, even within the church of Jesus Christ, to inflict harm upon God's flock. What sober warning? given by the apostle. What a heavy burden to place on the shoulders of ministers and elders. Is anyone, is any mere man sufficient for these things? Well, Paul knew, well, he was all too aware that both he and these Ephesian elders were insufficient for such a heavy responsibility. And so the last thing that we consider today is this appeal to the divine protector. Paul committed these elders. He commended these elders to the grace of God. In verse 32, Now I commend you to God, to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. They needed resources that God and his word alone could supply if they were to be faithful watchmen and faithful shepherds in the church. This word of grace, says Paul, is able to build you up and to give you inheritance among all those who are sanctified. God's word made effectual, verse 32 teaches us, accomplishes three things. First, it is able. It has the power. That's the word here. Dunamis. It's the word from which we get our word dynamite. It has the power to build you up, genuine spiritual growth, true spiritual maturity, whether personal or corporate, comes by the word of God. And speaking of doctrine, remember what Paul said about apostles and prophets 
evangelists, pastors, and teachers in Ephesians chapter 4. He gave them for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure of the stature that belongs to the fullness of Christ. How is that done? Doctrine. It's doctrine. How do we know that? Because Paul goes on to say, as a result, we're no longer to be children tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness and deceitful scheme. So the church, you see, not just the elders, is to be built up in doctrine. Nothing is able, nothing has the power except that doctrine, the Word of God, by the Spirit's power. Second, Word and Spirit give you an inheritance. Some of us have retirement accounts which is wonderful, the kind of security that, that, that a retirement account gives. But we have an inheritance that is far greater, contains riches that go so far beyond anything that we could possibly amass here on earth in such accounts. This inheritance is the sum total of the blessings that God has prepared for each one of his sons in Jesus Christ. That's what Paul says in that, again, in that letter to the Ephesians. And, and as, he, as he makes us aware of this, he's praying. He's praying for, for the church at Ephesus. But he's praying for us as well. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. The sum total of everything that God has given us in Jesus Christ. So it builds us up, this word of God made effectual by the Spirit. It gives us an inheritance. And third, it's by the word and by the Spirit that believers are sanctified. That's the terminal point of our salvation, Paul says, our sanctification. He says that in his letter to the Thessalonians. One of the other stops on Paul's missionary campaigns, the church in Thessalonica, chapter 5, verse 23 of 1 Thessalonians, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body, in other words, the totality of your being, be preserved complete without blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. When the, cons the consummation of all things takes place, when that great day comes, the great day of judgment, when Jesus comes with all his angels, when the trumpet sounds, when the dead in Christ rise first, Paul says, it's that sanctification. It's the end goal. That preparation for the coming day of Jesus Christ. 
to be sanctified, to be made holy. And that's what the word does. It makes us holy. We are not inherently holy. And God doesn't infuse any righteousness into us in our justification. So that we can say that somehow in in me, God has worked so that I have my own righteousness now. He doesn't do that when he justifies us by faith. So our, our confessional documents rightly say that that righteousness is imputed, it's credited, it's reckoned to us through the instrument of justification by faith. But then our confession also rightly goes on to say that God does, in another sense, infuse us with righteousness in our sanctification. And that really is our righteousness. And that's a wonderful thing. Because it means that not only do I have this glorious covering, not only do I put on the righteous robes of Jesus Christ, His blood-bought righteousness, His obedient righteousness, But God works righteousness in me. He makes me righteous too. So that I might do those works that bring glory to him. And so this commendation to God and to the word of his grace. What a fitting finale to Paul's missionary campaigns. This is it. On the shore of Miletus, with these elders, this this is the grand finale, so to speak, of Paul's missionary endeavors. And what a fitting one indeed, because this finale climaxes a series of texts in which believers are entrusted to the Lord's safekeeping. At the outset of Paul's first missionary journey endeavor, I remind you that the church at Syrian Antioch commended Paul and Barnabas to the grace of God for the work to which the Spirit himself had commissioned them. As they went through the the churches there in the, the Galatian province, of Asia Minor, in Lystra, in Iconium, in Pisidian Antioch, on this first campaign, a campaign appointing elders in every city, they, Acts 14.23 says, commended them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Likewise, recall that when Paul and Silas set off on the second missionary journey, the church at Antioch commended them to the grace of the Lord, Acts 15 and verse 40. And now in his address to these Ephesian elders, having completed his third campaign, Paul commends them to God and to the word of his grace, to the divine protector of the saints. How refreshing it is that we don't have to depend on sinful men, ministers, and elders in the church. Because behind those who are appointed by God to be watchmen and shepherds in the church is God and the word of his grace. Even though we know that the power is not ultimately in these men, it's a heavy weight. 
it's a heavy, heavy responsibility to shepherd and to watch over the flock of Jesus Christ. It's a reminder to pray for those who are given this responsibility. But with this weighty duty comes this encouraging promise. And standing behind God and the word of his grace are the promises of Jesus Christ himself, who said to his elders and to his church, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will build my church. I will not leave you alone. You will not be orphans. Even though I'm gone, even though I, I, I suffered that death, even though I, uh, you, you saw me arise from the dead, you saw me ascend, I'm no longer here with you, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send my Spirit, who is the Spirit of truth to be the great shepherd of your souls, even Jesus himself, the Spirit of Christ. Amen. Our Father, we we are humbled by these weighty things in the Scriptures. We're humbled by the dangers that the church faces. We're humbled by the responsibility that you have given to mere men to be watchmen and to shepherd the flock of God. And yet we appeal to the divine protector, even to you, O Lord. We appeal to you now. We pray for watchmen, we pray for shepherds in the church. We pray that you would embolden them, that you would empower them to be faithful in their duties, to bring scripture warnings by the power of the Spirit to the church of Jesus Christ. We pray that you would make them faithful shepherds in the church to shepherd the flock of God, to feed them, to care for them, to bind up their wounds to discipline them. But, oh Lord, we, we appeal to you and to the word of your grace that you might use that word in us to build us up, to give us the fullness of our inheritance and to sanctify us to the glory of your name. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.